representation of parts that will uh, diminish what's what we're seeing now in a lot of these uh, you know, situations where we're losing our young black men and women. Awesome. Don Oseman, same question. When you look at that mural of young black faces that throughout history have been voices of courage, uh, have been examples of righteousness. Uh, but when we look at the current mural of the lives that have been lost in the process of that, what is it that comes to mind or what is it that your heart feels? Yeah, when, when I look at that, it, it reminds me of what I felt um, when George Floyd was murdered, and it brought up similar feelings I had in Los Angeles when Rodney King was beaten, and I uh, was right in the middle of, of inner city LA during that time, and I was so, so shocked that it was happening to Rodney King, and I thought, haven't we made any progress? And then now when George Floyd was killed, I had that same feeling from 1992 to 2020, it just feels like we haven't made any progress. Uh, so there's a sadness about that. But uh, like Kanita, I'm also really hopeful because a lot of people, a lot of my white friends are paying attention more than they've ever paid attention before. And so there's a new, uh, People are, are arrested by what's happening in a different way than I've seen uh, in the 90s and since that time. So on one hand, I'm, I'm very discouraged, but on the other hand, I, I think there's a lot of hope in seeing all of you, this panel of millennials and my own kids and what they're doing. It gives me a lot of hope that um, for Pastor Ricky and I, we're passing the baton into good hands. Yeah, in the aftermath of George Floyd, there seems to be like this awakening, this revival that not only is this a problem, there seems to be this greater sense of acknowledgement, right, throughout the country, no matter what race you are, that racism is an issue, we need to deal with it. And we've seen, you know, so many communities hit the streets with riots and protests, um, even seeing colleges start to give um, uh, support and financial assistance and scholarships behind George Floyd. And this is a question for the whole panel. Are we in a special moment in time uh, where things are really changing or are we in the midst of white guilt? And in a year from now, will we tire of talking about diversity? Will we tire of talking about racism? Will we tire of talking about this race issue? Will we go back to, you know, let's get back to the gospel. We're, you know, we're tired of talking about this. Are we in a special time where things are really changing or is this just something that's going to um, wear out a year from now. Ricky, what do you think? You know, I think, that, uh, Adrian, uh, thanks for asking because I, I got a thought related to this. Um, in the spiritual uh, picture of things, I, I think the Lord, if I can say that, is keeping this before us. Um, I, I think America has a covenant with God. I really do, that all men are created equal. And when that covenant is broken, you have civil war, and then you have all these kinds of things happening. Um, and so I'm, I'm, a, I'm just really confident that God is saying, uh, I'm gonna keep it before you uh, until you humble yourselves and deal with this matter. And, and it, it, it will continue, but it, it needs to come to a place where we acknowledge that, um, change cannot be done legislatively. It has to be done through the heart. And you mentioned the word revival. I think what you're doing today uh, keeps us aware, but also it can foster um, a reviving of the heart because it is a heart issue. And because of media, we've seen how it has awakened uh, the, this dead horse of, of asleep. It's now awakened to um, the, the, the image of we can do better uh, as a society. We can do better. We can do better. We can do better. And I think it's going to continue until we acknowledge that this is a spiritual issue as much as it is um, um, a legislative issue. And that's, that's my take on it. And I think the revival that you're talking about is exactly where we need to be, be headed toward this uh, revival of the heart. Yeah, I appreciate what you're saying. I think one of the things we have to realize is you can't legislate character. That has right. to be personal 
inner transformation. So when we look at, are we still here? What needs to happen? Uh, we've done all we can legally in terms of laws and the right. White House. The answer is actually not in Congress. <laughs> it's not in our government. It's in everyone, especially in the body of Christ, looking at themselves and asking, where do I fit in terms of being a part of the problem or the solution? It's personal transformation of the heart. It's confronting your own biases and preferences. There is not going to be a turning of the, of the tide here unless we make some personal decisions um, that reach across all facets of life, right? Not just my family, but also my organizations asking ourselves, why are we so gridlocked? Why a Sunday morning? Uh, Malcolm X said, who was a Muslim, right? Malcolm X said, Sunday morning, still the most segregated hour in America. This is how we look to the world, <laughs> right? So when does that testimony begin to change? And some would argue that doors are open on one end, but they aren't open on another. And so we just need to dive into that a little bit more. Graham, uh, please chime in here. Are we in a special moment in time where we really have an opportunity to, to turn the tide here, uh, to change some of the things that are going on? Or are we in a, are we in a saga, uh, uh, an episode of white guilt that will wear off in a year and we'll get tired of having this conversation? It's a, it's a very interesting question that you ask because this is something that I wonder myself. Um, when uh, the whole um, George Floyd incident happened, my my parents actually live three blocks from where he was where he was murdered um, in Minneapolis. So I was I was able to actually go and spend some time with them while the riots were happening, um, just to you know give my sisters some some peace of mind. So I flew up last minute um, and was there and helped clean up the city um, the day after. And then you know night happened and it was kind of a a, a cycle of of cleanups. Um, however. I, I pray with all my heart that this is the beginning of true change. We, uh, uh, we've seen this, you know, this has been a, a cycle that has been going on, but it's really up to us um, whether this becomes just another saga of white guilt and we go right back in the scripture and say, you know what, this isn't a problem. We're not actually like, they're, they're overreacting. Mm -hmm. That could happen. But unless people like us actually take the time and to, to listen to all sides of, of the stories that's going on and truly try to understand from a, just a human standpoint of what it is maybe another community is going through and how we can change that and how we can fix it so that our children and our grandchildren don't have to go through the same thing so that they can learn from past mistakes, but then also make that better. Um, that's something I pray for. Um, that we can all just live and get along and, uh, you know, bring each other up. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know if that, if that helps at all. But. Yeah, absolutely. Sophia, you want to get in here? Yeah, I have been just, um, even just from all of this discussion, you know, the question is, is this for such a time as this, right? In the Bible, we see a, a political oppression a legislated oppression of, of the Jews and God orchestrated the placement of a young girl, Esther, into the kingdom with a position to change that. And, and she needed the encouragement of the older generation, her uncle Mordecai. And he said to her, you know, in Esther 4, I'm gonna just read this. He said, you know, if you remain silent at this time, liberation and rescue will still arise for the Jews from another place. And you and your father's house though will perish since you didn't help when you had the chance. And who knows whether you have attained royalty for such a time as this, and for this very purpose. Can we speak into this generation that this is what our God is always doing. He is always orchestrating and placing his people, young people, think about, your call to, to Christ. You know, I'm reminded of uh, 1 John 2, when he says, I write to you young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. And so if we have this faith in the salvation and the finished work of Christ, it says he has overcome. So therefore we embrace that inheritance as the body of Christ, then it is our time to respond to what he has been stirring. This is something that he is giving his church to say, let's go. 
We know the end of the story. We will be one. Jesus has prayed for us to be one. And he said that when we are one, John 17, the world will believe that God has sent his son and they will see the kingship of God on display through his church. So absolutely, we are in such a time as this and we've got to encourage one another to not give up, but to Amen. persevere with the faith and the confidence that our savior who has suffered for us died bearing all of that burden, giving us the opportunity then to have received freedom, receive forgiveness and to forgive one another and to live in a way where we can experience joy and suffering and say, we will endure to see this through, that God would be glorified to have his work of redemption, of justice through us. Amen. You know, where I'm, where I'm from, we say, and the church said, amen. That, that was so, so well stated, especially the example you gave about Esther coming into the kingdom that speaking into the time that she in that she's in and the task that God has given us requires courage. It does not require silence, right? And silence speaks agreement. Um, and it means that you're abdicating your role to actually be the change agent in the earth. Larry, uh, you're the director of teams for NAMAC and uh, Graham uh, mentioned that we wanna be able to pass something better on to our children, a better example, a better image of what the body of Christ should look like uh, when we stand up. How do parents begin to adequately prepare their children to engage with um, race relations and the race conversation in, in the American context? Yeah, great, wonderful question. And Sophia, uh, I was gonna say, you took all of my answers. <laughs> so <laughs> amen, that was, that was so wonderful of an answer. So um, a couple of things, uh, Pastor Rees. One, I, I, I wanna just maybe extend a word of warning to parents. And then turn around and maybe offer a couple of words of encouragement and or comfort, okay, um, in this area of kind of preparing their, their teens, right? Um, number one, it is vitally important that you do not assume, okay? Do not assume that this work is being done, that this, that, that race, racism, race relations is being rightfully taught to your team, okay? Um, and so, so this is a good time to really press into and, and be responsible for helping uh, kind of form your, your child in the way of the Lord, right, in this. And so don't assume that they're not struggling with, with the, the myriad of, of social media uh, that they have access to. Um, I'm sure many of our teens have watched uh, even the murder of George Floyd, right, as adults. It's hard for us to process, imagine where they are, right? And so uh, do not assume that um, it's too weighty of a conversation, right? Um, I have conversations with uh, some of the parents in my church about this. Uh, don't wait. Um, they've managed to learn a lot of other things, geometry, trigonometry. They can learn some theology and how the, the text of scripture, how the arc of scripture and the symphony of scripture points to justice, a just God and a just people, right? Um, and so the other piece is, is to be careful. Be careful to um, use vague kind of generalities, right, when your teen does open up and share their experiences with racism, okay, um, uh, how they have seen this kind of working in their lives and in the lives of their friends. Um, don't be careful to use dismissive language, okay, um, and so, so the Bible covers so much ground, right, uh, with um, uh, the Imago Dei in, in justice and righteousness and mercy. We need not shy away from these, these these, these scriptures, right, and help apply. Um, thirdly, and, and uh, I'll quickly end, uh, be honest. Um, I love what um, uh, uh, our, our other brother had mentioned of um, his trials uh, with racism, um, fighting and, and or getting, getting beat up and getting jumped and things of that nature, right? Let's be honest about our own experiences. Let's not, let's not hide those from our teens, okay? Um, we want to share our history. We want to share share with them right history of, of the church's involvement with slavery and segregation and Jim Crow, okay? We don't need to hide that from them. Um, I think lastly, it's okay to ask for help, okay? I want to encourage parents to ask for help. Uh, again, I'm a, I'm a lay pastor at our church. I, I help, uh, you know, our teens. I help our youth and, and adults, um, and so, um, yeah, we would love to come, come alongside you, right? Um, to, to walk with you in ensuring that um, we're kind of right, rightly dividing the word <laughs> uh, in, in right kind of proportion for where 
our young people are, many in our church, they are Christians. And it's our responsibility to shepherd the, the entire flock of God. And so um, engage in this work, uh, ask for help, be honest, and, um, and, and, and be careful. Awesome. I think that's great. You know, there's this great debate amongst evangelical Christians and within the churches. Is social justice a distraction away from the message? And absolutely not. Why? Social justice is a development of the gospel. It is not a distraction away from it. When we accept the kingdom of God, he causes us to speak out for the oppressed. He causes us to stand righteously. He waits all day to well uh, in, in Samaria for a woman, right, who is disenfranchised, who, uh, who has a questionable past, and he begins to transform her life. When the church began and, and, and the Hebraic widows were being treated differently than the Hellenistic uh, uh, widows, guess what? The deacons of the church were established by the apostles so that there could be equity in the treatment of God's pe people. Social justice is a development of the gospel. It is not a distraction away from it. That is a deflection because we don't really want to face some of the realities or we may be facing some guilt um, or we don't know how to lean into it, but we've got to be able to lean into those things. Larry mentioned, you know, discussing history with your kids. And so we're going to give you two resources that will help you to do that. We partnered with Missio Nexus uh, this month when it came to Black history and highlighting the contributions of African-American missionaries past and present. And so we're going to make that link available to you. It's a quick devotional you can take every day to learn about the lives of African-American uh, missionaries, uh, those from the past and those from the present. Also tomorrow night, uh, we're gonna be partnering with Bridgeway Church and I'll be speaking on the history of African-Americans and missions. And so uh, it's from 7 p.m. to 8.30. So we're gonna put that link in there available for you as well. And you can join that conversation. It's absolutely free. But those are some of the tools that help you to understand um, some of the history that you may not understand or some of the blind spots you have and to sensitize you toward other cultures that you're not really familiar with. Uh, Graham. Our white men, you know, we're in this uh, new era of diversity and inclusion where everyone's trying to figure out what that means. Are white men now the enemy of the state when it comes to diversity and inclusion? I'd say yes, honestly. Um, and, and this is just, maybe not, maybe enemy is a strong word. Um, I think there is a lot of desire to change. Um, you know, I, I've spent some time just talking to whether it's different pastors or church leaders, um, elders, and the desire is absolutely there. I think it's time as the white community to step back for a second. Um, and I, the only reason I say that is because I, the one thing I noticed is, you know, that desire to change as I was saying, is absolutely there. But we are not listening, and I say this as a, as a community, to the true problems that are going on on a day-to-day -day life um, for what the Black community is going through. Um, we, we like to say we have all the answers. We know how to fix it. We can step in and, and, and do it. But if we are still saying that there is no such thing as um, systemic injustice or police brutality, how can we really make a change? So I, I think to answer that question just a little bit, I mean, I think it's time for us to stop talking and just listen and, and, and actually see what is happening before we can take it onto our own hands and actually try to make a difference. We need to listen to our brothers and sisters what they're actually saying, what they're crying out for. They're <laughs> screaming out for help. We're like, we hear you, we hear you, but the system's fair. It, it, it can't go both ways. Okay. Don, similar question. Um, is this a time where white men or white people in general can lead? Do they need to be sitting back or is there, is there an opportunity or is there some expression of leadership that they can take uh, when it comes to the issue of uh, racial reconciliation or racial harmony? Yeah, I, I don't know about if leadership is the best where it may be uh, being uh, persistent. And so your earlier comment about, are we in an opportune time or is this gonna go away in a year or so? For white people, predominantly, they don't think about their ethnicity. It's not part of their daily consciousness. So it, our whiteness doesn't occur to us on a daily or monthly basis. It's whenever it comes up in a situation or on the news. And so it's very easy for these issues to fade away. And so 
to prevent against that, it means that means that uh, Anglo's need to be stepping into this and being persistent over the long haul. This isn't something that we're going to swoop in, uh, go to a, a really good uh, panel like this or read a book, have a conversation and then wrap it up and go home. This is a, a lifelong exercise of relationship, which is why Pastor Ricky and I started Reconciliation Fellowship as an ongoing until the Lord comes or we die, we're going to stay in this. And so I think that is a role for uh, all Anglos, but white males especially, that we need to keep being persistent because it doesn't occur to us natu naturally to, to think about these things. Awesome. Good point. I can't wait till we uh, give the audience an opportunity to actually discover Reconcilia uh, Reconciliation Fellowship. I think it would be a great, great addition to just your Christian diet and fellowship and what God is a part of in the earth. Um, and of all the things I have seen, it's the most organic and authentic. And so I highly recommend the next meeting, uh, as many of you be a part of that, uh, that meeting as possible. Sophia, does the conversation in America about race does it exclude other races? Is there an overemphasizing of black and white to the exclusion of other races? How do we begin to reconcile that, um, that reasoning? Yeah, I think our society and the media uh, will continue to compound uh, what we know as the black white binary of race in America. And there's a reason for that because in race in America, right, has rotated on this fulcrum of anti-blackness. So that is very relevant and true, right? That the reason why we have this struggle is because we have a history of Western civilization that has labeled people with darker skin as less evolved. And then ultimately with the institution of slavery as not even human, as property. And so race relations in the United States is going to always depend on that framework and we need to understand that framework of how that became so insidious this lie that has dehumanized all of us because we're all made in the image of God and if we damage that image of God by labeling people that are made in his image as property and have continued that over centuries reinforcing that um, in different ways rather through actually you know slavery or obviously through Jim Crow laws legislation right that have not allowed there to be freedom um, and so the, the conversation does relate to why, why is the structure there? But does that mean that we don't have a part as like Asian Americans or Hispanic Americans or Native Americans? No, it's that we're all under this reality that if we're all being dehumanized through this, we have a part, right? And a, and, a, and a part to play, especially in God's kingdom, right? As part of the body, if we play our part, then it will promote the health of the whole body. And so I think that um, where, yeah, maybe Asian Americans, right, are not even seen, <laughs> maybe as part of, but we were right alongside, you know, and you can look it up in your history books, you know, we were right alongside Martin Luther King, you know, in these marches, there is a history of um, minorities in this nation working together for civil rights. And we are thankful for our African American brothers and sisters who have had to lead the way because they have faced such grave injustice. Yeah, the history is different. I so appreciate what you said, right? A lot of times we have these conversations about race and it's almost used as a deflection where there's more than black and white. And that is certainly true, right? Uh, the, the, the sins against the First Nations in terms of Native Americans and how they were treated, right? Uh, the way that we handle immigration in this country, they all are issues that we need to be speaking into. But there is a unique history here between blacks and whites that has not been resolved. And so a lot of times uh, to shy away from that issue or because we're uncomfortable and we don't know what to say or we don't want to feel guilty, we just we, we start to deflect to other issues. And, and, and we need to not do that. We need to lean in, right? So it's like if I go to the emergency room and I am and sneezing and coughing, I may have the flu. But if you're sneezing and coughing, you may have COVID, right? We are there displaying the same symptoms, but for different reasons. And we need to stop deflecting and we need to lean into these things, even if they make us uncomfortable. 
This is what the Holy Spirit is there for, right? It is the comforter. It is the one that says, I may be wrong. I may be short. I may be uh, I'm misconceiving some things, but the Lord will give us wisdom and he will actually lead and be in this journey with us. And we need to stop deflecting. It's also this, this theology um, argument about there's no black church and there's no white church. Um, there's just one church. And there is scriptural merit behind that, right? But that is also culturally dismissive and we do not have the right to dismiss the cultures that God has created. Hey, listen, if you are in an area where it's predominantly white, you're probably going to a white church and there's nothing wrong with that. What's wrong is when we're not in fellowship with one another and when one part of the body needs help, the other parts don't show up. There are going to be, every church is not gonna be a multicultural church, ethnically speaking, right? They're gonna be white churches, they're gonna be black churches, the wonderful thing about technology is it's equalizer. It allows for us to fellowship now without having to call someone and put them on a plane in a hotel, right? We can have, have free fellowship, but there is definitely going to be different types of churches, and, the, and that's by God's design. When you look at the Church of Philippi, it is from a Roman, uh, a Roman colony of retired people, right? So if you have a church for the retired people, that's going to look very different from a Hillsong church, right? Or a church for the millennials. And the Lord wants this culture. He wants this diversity in the body of Christ. So let's not, let's not say things like that and then think that we're being spiritual by saying there's one church. No, uh, yes, there is one church in God, but they have different ethnic makeups and that's by design, that's by design. So when we talk about this issue of race um, and, and how people are interacting with it differently, uh, uh, Kanita, is the race conversation, is the race issue different for black women than it is for black men? Oh, Pastor Adrian, that's such a great question. And I think, um, I mean, this has just been so loaded. I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of full uh, just listening to all these responses. Um, but I think one of the best ways to answer that would be to share some of the collective effects on issues of race among Black women and men that would clarify uh, some of the nuances and differences that would signify our unique experiences. So collectively, we've both experienced the struggle of generational trauma and the re-traumatization of racial oppression that has taken its toll on both our mental, emotional, our spiritual health. And that's not always recognized. Uh, when we, when we are, are living from day to day in a fight or flight mode, um, constantly focused on survival. Um, and, and, and so when taking inventory of our emotions is not always understood. So that's a collective struggle that we have, carrying trauma from one generation to the next. Um, we have a collective uh, struggle of the socioeconomic and spiritual impact of systemic racism uh, and marginalization as a people. Uh, as Sophia mentioned earlier, being sold and used as property and, and subjects for experimentation, devalued, dehumanized, seen as less than a child of or image bearer of God. And we've collectively experienced uh, since the days of slavery, a breakdown of the family uh, where homes are no longer led by a father and a mother. So what's unique uh, to both of these and, and neither being less significant in the eyes of God are that black men are too often targets for those who seek to oppress or eliminate the voice of the black man, uh, having been victims of unjustified shootings, arrests, killings, and being marked as guilty until proven innocent. Um, black men are faced with a higher rate of incarceration uh, because of criminalization and, and potentially being etched out of the workforce and opportunities for economic advancement. And I would like to add re-entry as well. Um, I had several male, black male relatives who have been in the prison system and, and society views them as not having any worth trying to come back uh, and to reclaim some sense of dignity and uh, worth in their lives. Um, on the contrary, black women we experience some of these similar things as well, but what's unique for us um, is that we're objectified throughout history. And we've had our bodies used as property uh, and sometimes, some cases to reproduce against our will, uh, robbing us of our God-given voice and dignity. Um, and, and bringing that to a contemporary lens, we kind of touched on this uh, in our preliminary meetings as we look at the societal spheres of business, education, media, et cetera, uh, we've been subjected to what's been called the Madonna effect, 
Mm -hmm. um, only being cast in, in, in movies and in media roles as women without self-respect or dignity, uh, being the maid or the prostitute or something similar uh, to that. So society's view of Black women has not been one of esteem and respect. Um, and I can even say that as a, a, a Black woman, a dark-skinned Black woman, it has translated even to the Black community where we're comparing ourselves according to the shade of our skin. And so a lighter-skinned Black woman is con considered more attractive than a darker Black woman. And I grew up as a child hearing that uh, over and over and not being reminded of, of who I was in Christ. Um, another thing that Black woman also carries is an extremely heavy burden for her black sons and their fathers. While she too may not be safe, for example, Sandra Bland, Breonna Taylor, she also carries the weight of worry and concern over the safety and well being of the black men in her life. I'm being one, I'm a daughter of a black man and a sister to three black men. Um, and so, because of the bounty that's been over the head of the black man, black women have also had to step into these positions that they weren't necessarily called to be in. And in some cases, um, that's leadership in the home, at work, um, and at church, where, where there's been this absence of leadership and, and not always being acknowledged for it. So the Black woman battles this emotional fatigue, this perpetual emotional fatigue under the banner of bravery that says she just has to keep going. Um, and so this, this misalignment of these roles is certainly the enemy's attempt uh, at reversing the framework of the family God design and to distort God's view of humanity and its diversity as a gift, not a curse. Um, so yeah. the thing is that we're just, you know, living in this, this season where we're reversing the dysfunction uh, that we've seen uh, through the cross. I like that last part about reversing the dysfunction. What we have to understand is during the time of slavery, because African Americans were looked at as property, it was nothing for families to be split apart, right? And so yeah. even generationally, we're still dealing with where husbands were taken to one plantation, wives were left to another, um, and then children um, uh, being whatever, <laughs> wherever they, uh, where they were, wherever they could fit in, right? And so that dysfunction continued to uh, to go on, even in some of our. Um, our mission agencies, you know, sometimes there are barriers there that are not sensitive to the fact that there has been this breakdown of a family. I recall in one instance where a missionary wasn't allowed to serve because she was divorced. Um, and so issues like that we have to talk about, we have to bring to the table. There is a woman at the well that has five ex-husbands and then she goes into a city and wins that whole ex-city. Um, yeah. and, and wins that whole city. So I'm not sure that those type of stipulations, I'm a proponent of marriage, right? I believe in marriage, but we have to deal with the realities that people are in and not be barriers to them serving and coming together because guess what? Their stories matter, that brokenness matter. It actually speaks to the people who are going through those very same things. And so we have to make sure that our theology bows down to the kingdom of God. I'm really excited about next week's conversation. Uh, Kanita will actually be moderating next week's conversation about the state of women around the world. We're going to be dealing with uh, sex and human trafficking, education, economic empowerment, female mutilation. Um, and so there are going to be some issues that she's going to uh, dive deeper into. But when we look at this difference between the Black male and the Black female, they face this race issue with different types of pain. Uh, Ricky, uh, glad to see you're back with us. I know you're having a little power yeah. issues down there in Texas, <laughs> but um, uh, we're coming up on the one o'clock hour. So I'm going to make a couple of announcements and then Ricky, I'm going to go to you. We're going to take this conversation all the way to the cutoff time, which is 1.30 because it's so full. But we want to encourage you that if you are part of the table of brotherhood and you want to attend this year's NAMAC conference, um, we're going to put the link for you right there. There's actually a discount for people who attend the table of brotherhood to attend the conference. Uh, it's going to be another virtual experience. And so we're releasing the link out to you right there. We want to encourage you again to join us on tomorrow night if you want to hear about the history of African Americans uh, within missions, or you want to be connected to the devotional we've done in partnership with Missio Nexus, um, you can follow those links as well. And then also we're having a partnership meeting next Tuesday. If you work for an organization uh, that wants to be in partnership with NAMAC, uh, we're going to invite you to a partnership meeting with us. You can go ahead and register for that meeting and hear more about uh, what NAMAC is doing for the rest of the year as well as for our virtual experience. And so we're gonna dive back into our conversation. Uh, Ricky, are there generational differences in terms of how race is viewed in this country? Uh, is there a, a, a perspective that the older generation has 
that is very different from what you're seeing amongst uh, the younger generation? Uh, very good question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry about the, the internet situation here, but um, there is a major difference. I'm um, parenting my next generation group, my grandkids. I have seven of them living with me. And um, they, their take on this is much different than mine. I'm going to give you an example. My grandson gets in the car. It's 100 degrees in Houston. And he puts on a hoodie. And I say to him, take the hoodie off. <laughs> and he says, why? Then I tell him why. I tell him that if we're pulled over, more than likely, that policeman is going to think something totally different than who you are and, and what you represent. I ran out of light here. OK, there we go. And he's questioning me. I mean, in the car, he's going, I don't understand this. This is just a hoodie. I said, I know, but I live in Fort Bend County. <clears throat> he said, What's, what does that have to do with it? I said, well, um, there are policemen who uh, don't think a guy riding around with a hood uh, on is, um, is up to good. And not only that, but he's African-American. So the conversation got real deep to a point when I began to weep uh, because he didn't understand. He thought that I was kind of losing my mind. And I said, no, I'm not losing my mind. My mind is going back to the past. <laughs> The, the past says to me, when I listen to my father speak, when you're riding through a certain part of Houston, I want you boys to get under the, um, get on the floorboard. And he puts on a hat so that the policeman couldn't recognize him being black or white in the dark. And he would tell us to play whatever we can play in, in the, uh, on the floorboard of the car. <clears throat> and that came back up in me. So the past has affected me immensely. Mm. But I'm looking at protecting my grandson. He's going, what's up with that? This is a different world, Papa. All of my friends are white. So I have to have these conversations with them because their parents probably are telling them about Blacks. So how you relate to your white friends, you may not know it or not, but they have a picture of a conversation they've had with their parents like I'm having with you. Yes. And that's a, that's reality. That's just reality. So the, there is a distinct difference. And I have to catch myself in relating to my grandchildren so that they will understand the past that they might not repeat it and then help them to go a little bit further than I could have ever gone. So, yeah, there is a distinct difference. And I think that's based on your age, based on your experience. And um, and our kids today, my my, my grandkids, they don't see it that way. Yeah, this is interesting, right? Because we are, uh, Kanita, you and I, we were raised by African-American parents, right? Who have certain memories of race in this country. They have certain things that they can't unsee. Uh, I remember, Graham, you and I were talking and you've actually seen someone set on fire, right? So as you're raising up your children, you're trying to give them wisdom in the context that you have. I was having this conversation in my own church and one of our seniors, she just said, Pastor Reza, I, I can't forgive them. I, I, can't, I can't let them in. You don't know what they did. And so uh, as you and I, Kanita, are born in a different time where you have a Barack Obama, who's now the president, uh, who, 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 who was uh, president of the United States, we believed what our parents told us, that you could do anything. We began to see a different reality. Um, and there was almost this divide within the Black community that younger Blacks were hopeful um, they had this overcoming attitude. They thought racism was behind us. And then the recent years have kind of smacked us in the face. <laughs> and there's been this reality. And so the older generation has kind of said, I told you, I told you they were like this. Yeah. It hasn't gone anywhere, right? And so there are these living memories that we're all trying to minister to and find out, should we be angry? Should we be silent? Uh, have they been like, have they, right, been like this all along? How do we how do we not other one another, right? And and, yeah. and so there's been that divide there. But then you find something uh, like reconcil the reconciliation fellowship that Don and Ricky came together on. And I want to know how did you all come up with this concept of reconciliation fellowship 
and what exactly is it? Because I feel like just my one experience there, this is exactly what needs to be happening in the body of Christ. Everyone's asking for resources. So what do we need to be doing? And again, I'm going to, I'm going to dive into that a little bit later because what you need to be doing may be the wrong question. But let's talk about um, reconciliation fellowship because what the Table of Brotherhood endeavors to do is to provide solutions. And I feel like this is definitely a model of what we need to be carrying on throughout the generations. Well, so I, I, I do think... Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I do think uh, that what you just described is, is a solution, a part of the solution, is that two older guys got together right after George Floyd's event and began to ask the question, you know, why now? What do we need to do about that? So the conversation began when my white brother gave me a call and said, Ricky, how are you doing? And I couldn't help but kind of pause a little bit, just like I just did to say, now, this is interesting that he's calling me to find out how am I doing? And then I posed the question to him a little later on. Now, let me ask you how are you doing? <laughs> and that's when we discovered <clears throat> that we were <clears throat> experiencing something that others need to experience. The question, how are you doing? And then listening, being empathetic as well, being concerned, uh, having an open ear. And our conversation got so good that we said others need to experience this conversation of how are you doing? <laughs> and the idea about the um, uh, the floorboard situation came up and uh, being the first African-American in an all white school, got beat up twice, came up and, and he was able to listen, to be able to sympathize, to be able to hear. And out of that, Don and I came up with what we believe is a biblical response uh, based on our cultural experiences and based upon our relationship as we've been knowing each other since we've uh, been doing church planting and working in prisons together and meeting up in um, Wichita, Kansas, when they had a, a meeting uh, to discuss the Onesimus Project. And I was very interested in that. And I met Don. And Don was this kind of guy that was not um, um, hiding from the, the race issue. He was trying to engage in it and becoming an advocate for those who could not speak for themselves, especially in criminal justice. So that's how we got together. And um, it, it's been fun to ask the question every time we meet, how's it going? How are you doing? It's the, it's the question of fellowship. That's yeah, right. Don, yourself, Reconciliation Fellowship. Uh, how did it start? Um, and what can people expect when they get there? Well, it started just as Pastor Ricky described. And so we were in a conversation and so much was happening in the culture and in the media. And we said, we really need to have a biblical, kingdom-minded, Jesus-centered approach to this that seems to be lacking in a lot of the things that we're hearing. And so we said, what if we started a quarterly Zoom meeting that was a fellowship, not just an educational platform, but actual a time for believers to come together, look in the word, seek Jesus and his kingdom together in relationship, in community. And COVID has taught us with Zoom, we could do that. So we invited people all over the country. So we have people involved from several states all over the, the country who come in. We meet on a quarterly basis. We meet for just one hour and we try and keep it to that one hour because the purpose is to meet people in that one hour and then follow up in between the quarterly meetings. So. It's, it's a launch point for relationship outside of the meeting. So Ricky and I uh, give some thoughts from the word for about a half hour between us. We remind each other of, of what um, the principles of the kingdom are on these matters. And then we break everyone out to small groups, breakout groups of four to six, have them discuss what we just taught about. And then we end at the after an hour and encourage them to have at least one meeting with uh, somebody else that they met through Reconciliation Fellowship. So 
we're praying that the the fruit of it comes outside of the meeting, that the meeting just introduces people to relationship with someone who's not like them themselves. Yeah, that's what I found about your model that is really helpful. It's deeply, deeply relational. It's not just about reading a book. <laughs> Listen, guys, reading a book alone is not going to solve this issue. The issue, the issue is not reading more books. And actually, uh, in a couple of months, we're going to have a, a, a global Bible study uh, to show you that the Bible is the best diversity and inclusion manual you'll ever need. We just haven't seen, we haven't looked at it through the eyes of Jesus. And so I definitely want you to be on the lookout for that global Bible study to actually use the word of God as your manual for culture and diversity, but you really need to be building relationships. And that's what I found uh, so rewarding out of Reconciliation Fellowship. There are relationships that come out of it. We're starting to see our whites go to our, our black Sunday school um, uh, school teachers uh, classes. And there's this interfellowship that needs to be happening. Um, and it's it, it gets rid of all of the excuses. So I just want to encourage people, we put the link in the chat for you all to be, um, be a part of that. As we step into the solutions portion of this conversation, we're about to um, engage with some of the questions from the audience. Don, how do we need to be redefining the race conversation according to scripture? What is it that the word tells us about race or ethnicity that will really help us to build a new foundation for understanding from God's perspective? Yeah, one of the things that we mention every time we meet in Reconciliation Fellowship is to try and use biblical language that helps us. Um, Acts 17, 26 talks about we're all created in the image of God through one person, through one human couple, Adam and Eve, that there's one race. So we use in our culture uh, the term race or racial reconciliation, but it's kind of a misnomer biblically. What we're trying to get is ethnic reconciliation because there's one race, but there are 14,000 different ethnicities, 14,000 different people groups that, that Jesus is, is mentioned being worshiped in Revelation 7, 9 by every tribe, people, language, and nation. So that represents the 14,000 ethnicities on the earth. So there's one race creating the image of God, 14,000 ethnicities that will stay ethnic into eternity. And so we're not trying to create some Americanized melting pot. God values the distinctiveness of those 14,000 ethnicities. So uh, we try to use that kind of language, not that you get in trouble if you say race or racial reconciliation, but we try and use that biblical language of, of ethnicity rather than race. I think that's good. We need to return and we need to reclaim biblical language, right? So uh, even the word inclusion is more of a secular word, but what did God say in John 17? He wished that we would be one as he and the father are one. So we need to focus on oneness. We need to understand race in a human um, from, from a biblical perspective is that there's one human race with all these different facets of ethnicity that we don't need to dismiss. We need to embrace. And this is the whole point about there being a black church or a white church, right? We also need to deconstruct some of these social, um, some of these social labels. We don't think about white people as having an ethnicity, right? So, uh, Graham, you are you, you. Someone looks at you and says, "Hey, that's a white boy," but he's a white boy that grew up in Kenya. And so, what was your experience like transitioning back to the U.S.? Did you know you were white growing up because you went there when you were two? Did did, did your difference in in your skin color? Um, how did it impact your growing up versus coming back here to the States? No, I, I, I appreciate that question. Um, I, I didn't know I was white growing up. Um, you know, I did have mirrors and, and stuff like that. And it was pretty obvious that I was a little little bit different looking from my friends. Um, however, it, it, was, it was tough because, yeah, I, I moved over there when I was two. So I didn't really have a choice in where I was being brought up, you know. Um, so I, I made that my home. I, I fell in love with the people and the culture, and, and that really became a part of my identity um, to the point when I turned 18 and I moved back to the States, I felt out of place. All of a sudden, I'm, I'm in a setting where I'm not the only person who looks different. Um, I'm not a minority anymore, but I didn't feel like I fit in. 
anymore. <laughs> it was, it, it was, it was a tough um, thing for me to kind of deal with. And in doing so, I, I, I kind of fell off the wagon. Um, I went through a lot of uh, hardships and made a lot of big, big mistakes. Um, you know, I'm human. I'm not perfect. I, I, I can be transparent enough with you guys to, you know, say that I've, I've made a ton of mistakes in my life. And I, I think having that being ripped from my home once I graduated high school, it, it made me, it made me a little bitter um, because, you know, it's like, and for a while, like it, it was something that I, I was having a hard time, like forgiving my parents for. It's like, you, you took me across the world, raised me up. And as soon as I'm ready to actually, you know, do my thing, now you're putting me in a whole new situation. Obviously, I, I don't feel like that. I, I, I love them. They were doing what's best for the family and, and what they were feeling like they were called um, to do um, for God's work. At the same time, it, it allowed me to really see the interactions that people have on a human basis. Um, growing up there, it wasn't more of a, race was not really an issue. Um, it wasn't, oh, you're a white guy or you know, you're Asian, South American, whatever. But it was, I still saw issues of people versus people. Um, tribalism was a, was a huge issue, especially 2007 um, after the election there. We had about three or four months that just erupted into violence. Um, thousands and thousands of innocent people were just murdered. Um, as you said earlier, you know, I was literally on my school bus and we were, we got caught in this riot and I saw somebody burned alive. I mean, that's not something most, I don't know, a, 12 year olds go through um at, at the same time it, it opened my eyes that you know just because this person was from a different tribe in the same country they had to lose their life because they were just different and looking at the the race issues that are happening here it's really it breaks my heart i, I don't understand why why we have to label each other from being different i mean I, I love, one thing I love about culture is, is the difference and, and what that brings to the table. Um, you know, and I think that's just a, a, a person to person interaction as well. Um, you know, I, I have my strengths, but I also have my weaknesses. And, you know, Pastor, you have your strengths that could counter set my weaknesses and actually really kind of solidify that. Um, I, I, just having that unity, I think, is, is something that's very, very important. Um, so yeah, I, I think that um, music is something that I, I, I can use. Um, I've noticed music brings people together. I've played a lot of different shows and venues, obviously not in this last year, um, but seeing that, it, you know, people really just come together and it's, it's all about love at the end of the day. And if we can just share that <laughs> with whoever we're standing next to and, you know, enjoy the moment and really just open up to each other and, and hear each other where we're coming from. Uh, that That's, in my eyes, that's the best way that I can at least start a change and at least get the conversation going, you know, creating an atmosphere that is comfortable for people to be in and then letting God do the work from there. Like, I'm, I'm, just, a, I'm just a tool. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna transition to audience questions, but I know Kanita has something, so I wanna give her an opportunity before we go into that segment. Kanita? Really quick, I just wanted to echo what Graham was saying. Um, firstly, uh, She's Asian Nation was started out of those tribal clashes that you were talking about. And then as we just kind of go over this conversation, um, it's a reminder of the all out attack against the plan of God to be worshiped by all people, tribes, tongues, and nations. And so when we think about these things that we're going through, we have to really assert the authority that comes from the word of God that says that racism, tribalism, nationalism, patriotism, all of these things have no place within every tribe, every tongue, and every nation God. And the church really can't unite apart from that foundation of truth. So if, if racism has impacted our history, then it's definitely gonna impact our theology. And I think that's part of the problem. Some people innately believe that to be superior is a part of their faith. And so I think one of the things that has really been exposed over 2020 and what we're experiencing now 
is that American Christianity is not equivalent to biblical Christianity. We've done that and even taken that from a Western context onto the mission field. We're not better. We're created in the image of God and we minister and are on mission to those who are also created in the image of God. And so I just think that we need to align ourselves with the mission of Jesus fully by deconstructing this, this racism that has influenced our history and theology and that we're really aligning ourselves with Jesus's incarnational ministry that was boundary crossing. By its nature, it was boundary crossing in his ministry. He crossed the first boundary by entering into human history and then his future power enter into our human present through diverse proclamations of the gospel, healing, teaching, exorcism. Um, but then we saw that his incarnational ministry is our model. His proclamation of the gospel took down racial boundaries by its very nature. He crossed all of these things that we erect, ideologies and idols that we exalt over the true and living God. It's time to bring those down by standing on the truth of God's word and really proclaiming it in this generation so that people who are thinking wrong about their faith and about God's mission, because understand that it's gonna create bottlenecks in missions mobilization if you don't see an image bearer of God as a participant in God's mission. And so that's something that we really need to be acknowledging, repenting for. And then also we as a, a people, African-Americans, although we have been done unjustly, we can't be bitter about that. Uh, Pastor Brian Loritz puts it this way, I have to subjugate my blackness to his Jesusness. And so that changes the game for us. We, we, we come from an understanding that although we may have been done wrong, we have an opportunity to be ministers of reconciliation through the supernatural transformation of Jesus Christ. And I think we just have to be reminded of that because I was telling Don yesterday, I, I heard a pastor say, a black pastor say that he uh, does not trust any white person as a pastor. Now, how are you gonna disciple your flock telling them to perpetuate the same division that has been you know, shown to you which will eventually be a part of what's antithetical to the scriptures itself. And so now you're being used as a tool of the evil one to accomplish the opposite of Psalm 67, that all peoples will be worshiping him and that all the peoples will be praising him. And so that's what we need to just be reminded of. Yeah, I, I so feel what you're saying that we as African-Americans cannot reverse. <laughs> we can't become the reverse of uh, now we're gonna discriminate uh, what does the scripture tell us? You know, to be angry. You know, God understands our frustration. He understands our hurt and pain. He's not afraid of it, but he's the one that knows how to transform that, right? So there definitely is justification for why we feel the way we feel. But if we're going to be the image of Christ in the earth, then we have to subject, we have to subject our feelings and our opinions to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, right? And say, Lord, how do we become the solution? Um, and to understand that God, he is not Republican. He is not Democrat. And here's an announcement. He's not even an American. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So our nationalism has to bow down to the throne of God and say, what is God trying to do in the earth? And we have certainly turned him into the American flag, but he's got his own blood. He's got his own banner and he's stronger, wiser than, than any of us. And so we've got to go into that. One of the, one of the, um, the, the key questions we're constantly asked is, what can we do? What can we do? I'm sick of talking, but let me just encourage you we don't necessarily need to be asking ourselves what we can do. We need to be asking ourselves, who do we need to become? And who do we need to unbecome? The last frontier here in this race issue is about heart transformation. It's not about doing anything else because we've done enough. What did Jesus tell his disciples when he first sent them out? Don't go beyond the lost tribes of the house of Israel because he already knew there was prejudice in their heart and that they would take the gospel into regions and do more harm with it than they would good. So sometimes there is this pause, there is this uh, inner looking at that we have to have before we go any further in our ministry, before we go any further in our reach. Uh, maybe there's a 1040 window that God is protecting them from our bad missiology, from our bad <laughs> messaging of the kingdom of God, right? And so there has to be, what do I actually need to become? And so a lot of questions that are, oh, what, what do we need to do? How do I educate? So there are some great questions here that we're going to try to um, try to quickly address panel in the last nine minutes of this panel. Um, 
Uh, Cam Toll says, I'm a white millennial and a father of two young white boys, four and one years old. How do I start the conversation about racial injustice with them? How do I engage them at such young ages? I put out in there in the name uh, in the chat resources that you can go to. There's actually a children's book um, that our, dire our marketing director, uh, uh, Eddie Thomas, created uh, that talks about African Americans throughout history. You want to make sure that the reading and the images that you're showing your children are diverse images, right? If all of our literature has white faces on it, we need to throw that literature out <laughs> and we need to bring in literature that looks like an, act, an actual reality of th throughout history, right? Native Americans, uh, Latino brothers and sisters, those who are um, differently abled, right? They have all made history. And so you need to be showing and giving your children an appreciation for difference at a young age. Here's the thing, um, brothers and sisters, we have to celebrate difference and not tolerate it. We have to celebrate our differences and not minorities know when you invite them into their organizations, when you're doing it just for token pieces, when you're doing it just to check off a box, or if you're really interested in what it is they have to say and what they contribute, right? So differences have to be celebrated. And that means there's going to be a change in you because we have to stop demonizing that which is different. Even in our leadership styles, just because something is different than what you're used to doesn't make it wrong. And so change is something that is very, very hard for us all to embrace. But here's, um, that's a question I wanna to pitch to the panel. Uh, Sophia, what is something that, that, that uh, whites can do uh, in this time? How can they help? Well, you, you pose the question here with whites. I'm not, I'm not sure if I can answer that question. Um, but I think just as the church, you know, as believers and followers of Jesus Christ, I mean, we are called to a deeper discipleship with Jesus. I mean, just these things that we have talked about, how Kenita was, was saying, I was just like, hey, man, preach it, girl. Because, you know, he is the one who did the first thing, right? He loved us first. He loved us while we were still enemies. He crossed intentionally these social barriers and he actually submitted under his own limits, right? And subjugation as an ethnic person, right? Like in this Roman empire, right? He was a Jew and so he suffered under that. And so if we really enter into these spaces you know, I think on the one hand, yeah, maybe for our, for really everyone, um, we want to offer to the Lord everything that he's given us, right? But we don't know what we have <laughs> if we have not gone into our story and into the, the, the history, right, of our own people and what is it that we're bringing to the table. And so as we do the heart work, essentially, and the hard work, of looking inside of our own identity and what has shaped us to identify things that are idolatrous, things that need to be surrendered, um, then now I can bring myself to the Lord and say, you know, this is painful. Like, this hurts. Like, I wondered myself, you know, God, like, I could have grown up in China, you know, and, um, you know, Chinese people really ethnically, right, are the largest people group in the world. Okay, like <laughs> there's so many people and I could have been a part of that majority, but no, Lord, Acts 17, right, this is where I get grounded. Acts 17 tells me that Jesus, right, God chose and appointed the times and the boundaries of where all these people that are one of one, one people, right, where he placed them and why did he do that? What I, what I love is don't miss the next verse, right? The verse 27 of Acts 17 says he did that, right? There was a purpose clause in that. He placed us in our places so that we might know God and that we might seek God and that we're, he's not far from us. And so in our pain and in our suffering and in our questions of God, why did you allow me to grow up in white normativity and have to face this racism as a child? Well, why? Maybe it's because with that same story, there are people that he is equipping me if I will be enable him to heal me in those spaces that I can now bring that good news of Jesus Christ to those people that are also suffering and hurting because honestly we all are right and so in the most unreached people groups of the world that remain most of them are ethnic minorities right they are suffering under injustices you got people groups like the Uyghurs right right now in China which are finally making the news here but it's been going on for a while I mean if we as people who have suffered and have done the heart work 
of getting to a deeper theology that can offer up to the Lord God in your sovereignty. You did not make a mistake when you placed me here to suffer under this or to experience this. Then I want to see what you're doing in me and then to offer that hope and salvation that comes only through trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah. So we have God, you know, it's all for his mission. It's all for his glory. <laughs> so let's embrace our stories and give each other grace um, yeah. because you know what? That's the grace that we've received in Jesus Christ. Hey, Amen. I feel like, I feel like Sophia is Mr. Calling. She needs to be a pastor, right? I mean, <laughs> she's just yeah. coming with fire today. We've got to be connectors, right? I remember last year she introduced me to, to, to a new brother, um, Eric King, right there at, at Sen International. And I came home and told my wife, I said, this is a white boy I would have hung out with in college and had a beer with. Like, I just enjoyed his company. But that comes from being open. That comes from being not, 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 not walking around with a chip on your shoulder and asking God to show you where your brothers are, show you where your sisters are, show you where those people are who you can lock arms with um, and, and build relationships. And I feel like Ricky and Don have done exactly that. So we've got three minutes. We're going to do a round robin. And just what do you want folks to walk away with from this conversation? So if you each could take, take 30 seconds and just um, be able to share that, Don, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I would say the keys are for reconciliation, our education, relationship, and collaboration. That we've got to have education like we're doing here, but it has to go to relationship, either through what we're doing or uh, somebody else put in the chat, monthly thing that they're doing, something that is intentional that keeps relationship going. And then the ultimate fruitfulness will come when we collaborate together on an equal footing. So when we do ministry for the sake of the kingdom across ethnic lines together, that's when we're going to really see the flywheel turn when we collaborate in, in ministry together. Amen. Amen. Ricky, how about you? I, I think uh, Sophia really nailed it for me. Um, realizing that God has allowed us to experience this so that we can be a part of his mission to help others. Um, I like to suggest that we carry this attitude that I think the Apostle Paul carried, and that is I must become all things to all men that I might win some. And what that says is when you walk into the marketplace and you're different, you need to shout aloud, I am here. <laughs> you know, I'm here for you. I want you to learn. Um, Don also nailed it as well as starting something. Our ministry at KSBJ Radio, which is 90% white, started a diversity uh, group. And so we meet once a month to talk about each other's ethnicity and our background. Whites are included, blacks are included, where we can sit at a table, the brotherhood table, and share who we are and where we're going and what's happening with us now. Awesome. Mary, how about you? Yeah, um, this has been a fantastic conversation, but yeah, I want to, um, if it's okay, Pastor Reese, I'm, I'm going to kind of push back on, on something just gently, okay? Uh, we said we, there's nothing that we have to do, and somebody's itching to say, what do we have to do? And I'm, I'm just drawn to Isaiah 1, uh, 16, 17, where the Lord says, no, wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. Remove the evil deeds. Stop doing evil. Learn to do good. So there is actually something in, in, in confession. Don't jump into reconciliation until there's some confession right yeah um, that's that's clutch you don't even need to have no conversations really you, you need let's start let's start there okay and then now once we once we're in in a state of confession and we are learning up under our other brothers and sisters in christ who are discipling in us us in informing us in this conversation the text goes on to say seek justice correct oppression right uh, uh plead the widow's cause Beloved, justice is something we ought to do and, and because it's restorative. And, and see, um, you all know the text, Matthew 23, 23. If we don't pursue justice, and we're just we're, we're, we're mainly just kind of listening and absorbing and reading, if we're not pursuing justice, then now we're neglecting justice. And see, now we're trying to worship minus justice, which is not really biblical. And so I, I, um, I want to just share just that really quickly and sorry to end on that. <laughs> but, no, but I, think that's, I think that's actually, draws I us, yeah. Yeah, I certainly didn't mean to say that we don't need to do anything, but I think we, that question has been right. asked. There's been an overemphasis on doing 
And so uh, Matthew Ellison, who we had a couple of table at Brotherhoods ago, has a great quote that says, knowing comes before doing. And that's so time I feel like we're jumping into doing yep. without knowing the right things. And the verse that you just gave is a great example of that, that we actually have to know who we need to become and then go and do that, right? But we really need to become something in the private chambers of our heart and prayer closet so that there's personal transformation and we're not acting, we're not being fake, we're not taking disingenuous chances and opportunities at reconciliation when we really don't mean it, when we will go silent when we're around our friends or our family members who are making crass jokes, when we're really not standing up. If you really wanna be an advocate for black people to front the hypocrisy that are in the organizations and churches that we all go to and love, but we're not willing to stand up against um, or stand up to, I should say. Uh, Graham, how about yourself? That was actually a perfect segue to, to come into the point that I wanted to talk about um, is, is being that voice um, when some other people may not be there to stand up for it. You know, um, I'll, I'll use an example. I, I work in the restaurant industry. So a few weeks uh, back, I, I overheard a coworker saying, now most of my coworkers are predominantly white or Latino. Um, we got a couple, couple of uh, black people working there as well. Um, but during that shift, it was mainly white people around. And I heard one of my coworkers, he was, he was referencing uh, some hip hop lyric and he used the N word in that mm. and nobody said anything. And I pulled him aside. I, I didn't want to make a big scene in front of everybody. You know, I, I didn't want to escalate the situation, but I pulled him aside. I'm like, dude, like, I, I, I know that you heard that from, from a lyric from somebody who is black and, and who can say that. But for you to be saying that in front of other people who don't understand the significance of that word and the pain that comes with that word, you are doing so much damage that you, you don't even realize. Like that is a word that we need to completely get rid of. And I understand you may have not been saying it from, from this place of, of hate, but that is where that leads. Yeah. So, so you know, honestly, I, I wanna encourage um, just members of the white community, you know, if you are hearing something that somebody's saying that, you know, just because, you know, it's behind their back, like some, somebody else's back, doesn't make it okay. You know, I think we learned this all as, as children, but, you know, the one person who hears you is God, he knows your heart, and he knows where you're coming from. Um, so, you know, regardless of whether they're not around, I mean, he still hears you, and, and he knows where you're coming from. So don't, don't be afraid to, to step up and be that change um, when nobody else will speak up. Um, that's, that's the best way that we can start slowly moving forward and actually coming closer to unity. Awesome, awesome. Mm -hmm. Sophia, last three, uh, oh, Kaneda, Kaneda, I'm sorry, we didn't get a chance to hear from you. Oh, no problem. Honestly, uh, Larry was very, very close to what I was going to say. I, I would say that we need to lay down our idols and take up our cross. Uh, we serve a God uh, who was willing to abandon heaven for our behalf, for justice, for the vulnerable, for the marginalized, for sin, so much so that he went to the cross. And so we're in a time where we need to be ready to contend and confront and not have a convenient Christianity, even in our mission, mm -hmm. that we will be so passionate about this message and really reevaluate and, and, and re be zealous in our repentance, that we would even be willing to die for this message, that we would even be willing to die for our neighbor, for our brother, uh, for someone who does not look like, think like, or act like us. Um, and so that's why I'm just reminded, we need real reckoning, real repentance, real reconciliation, real reconstruction. If we're mm -hmm. not gonna be real about this, uh, then we're going to continue to go in this vicious cycle of conversations, kumbaya moments, panel discussions, and things that we're not really going to take the action and go out on. But my prayer is that we would, as a church, really come together, standing on the real authority that we have in Jesus Christ uh, and his word, that we might see transformation in his kingdom come, his will be done. Yeah, I believe this isn't a time for lukewarm Christianity. What did God say? I'll whether you be hot or cold, or I'll have to spit you out. And so they're in a time, I believe, in Christianity where God is saying, repent or be removed. And that even means from your sphere of influence that we can't have false, 
fig trees out there that have no fruit, right? But then want to call yourself a Christian. There does come a time where there has to be a reckoning. And I believe, uh, Kanita, you spoke so eloquently into that. Sophia, last 30 seconds before we pray out. Seek first the kingdom of God. And when we see him um, and we are inspired by what he is overseeing, you know, that he is sovereign, that he is good always to his people. And we can ask that question of, you know, why has he saved me? When we go to confession, like Larry's saying, right, we realize, wow, this is a gift from God. And so I am no better than anyone else. I'm no less than anyone else. The gospel is the great equalizer. And in fact, he says, I follow now Jesus, right? I, fo I follow me, right? So I follow Jesus, the suffering servant, who is also the savior of the world, the king of every tongue and tribe and nation. And he is the one who says, I've I have all power and authority, right? Jesus is the one who has all power and authority. And then he says, so now I charge you to take that message with that because I'm with you, right? And if you abide in me, then you have all power and authority, right? To bring this message of reconciliation to the ends of the earth. And so when we keep that kingdom mindset in play, I think that he's given us such a enormous, right? Incredible um, and finishable task of making him known, his glory revealed among the nations. And the thing is that we desperately need one another to make that happen. We can't do this alone. This is not a job for one person. It needs all the parts of the body. And so that mission actually drives us together. And so like a championship sports team, right? Every part's got its, its player. They cannot win that championship. We cannot finish this task of mission without one another. And that's why he's given it to us that we might fall under his mercy and be matured in our faith, Ephesians 4, right? As each one does its part. So revealing his glory through our oneness in Christ. Um, that's our goal. That's our hope is that he will do it because he is faithful to complete all of his purposes. Amen. I love how you opened up, you know, with uh, Seek Ye First, the Kingdom of God. That's actually our theme this year for the NAMAC virtual experience boldly proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And so we've got some great speakers, great panel discussion lined up in terms of, are we even going with the right message? What type of gospel are we preaching? And so again, we wanna encourage you, there is a discount for the uh, virtual experience if you are a Table of Brotherhood participant, and we'll put that link in the, uh, in the chat for you to start registering. Our early bird goes to the end of February. Make sure you come back next week. Kanita Benson, as you see right there, is going to be moderating that panel. She's got some great topics lined up in terms of the state of women and the contributions they have made. I'm going to close out with a couple of words, and then Brother Larry will close us out in prayer. There was a question asked that I just wanted to uh, give my last two cents on. It was, what advice do we have for young activists? Because we were talking about this millennial generation, and I wanted to share three things. Number one, build bridges with other generations, right? The young people, uh, there's this old saying they used to teach me in church. Uh, they call the young because they, um, they call the old, be they call the young because they're strong, but we call the old because they know the way. And so when the Bible says that his truth endures to all generations, God wants us to have relationships between the generations so that we're approaching this together so that their wisdom, their knowledge is coming down to us and that we're approaching it with our style and our expression and our strength, but we're actually working together. Get yourself a mentor. Get yourself a mentor who's not just your color, right? So our brother Don here is a great, great inspiration to me for some of the personal aspirations I have. But build bridges with the older generation because they have seen things you and I have not seen and they can give you a clearer picture and they have some testimonies and stories to share. Be bold, be bold, be willing to stand out. If God has placed something on your heart, don't look to the left or the right for an amen corner. You and God make the majority. Be bold, boldly stand up and do what it is that God has called you to do, right? And then lastly, network, right? There's no such thing as a well-rounded person but there are well-rounded teams. In other words, God gives us everything we need on the team that we're on. You are not gonna have all gifts and all insight. You actually need to network. You need to put people around you who have gifts and talents that you do not have uh, because whatever God has called you to do, if God's called you to do something, it is bigger than yourself. It's gonna require more people. It's gonna require more money. And so you're gonna need to enlist um, a team around you that can help you carry that 
to the, uh, to the finish line. And so I just want to encourage young activists that are out there to build bridges with other generations, to be bold, and to build yourself a well-rounded team. Amen? So Brother Larry is going to close us out in prayer. I'm going to ask the panelists to stick around for a couple of minutes um, as we just kind of recap over the conversation. Thank you all so much for being here today, and God bless you. Larry? All right. Let us, uh, yeah, let us uh, take the opportunity for this grand privilege of uh, bowing our heads and looking to the Lord together. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come before you thanking you for this conversation, thanking you for the panelists, thanking you for the, um, the guests, thanking you for the moderator and Pastor Adrian, thanking you for NAMAC for creating this avenue and this way to uh, for have to have brothers and sisters in Christ from all different places, from all walks of life, Lord God, to speak to the matters at hand. And Lord God, we ask that you would create in us a clean heart. And Lord God, renew a right spirit within us. And Lord, we pray that you would also help us to deny ourselves and not our neighbors. Lord God, we pray that you would, you would help us to take up our cross. And as Kanita mentioned, Lord God, not our comforts and or the culture, Lord God. Help us to decouple ourselves from, from this madness that we see in the world, Lord God. And help us to follow you with all that we are the unique people that you had made us to be, made in your very own image, Lord God. And we, we also want to pray that you would help us to, um, uh, to, to, to seek justice, Lord God, to love mercy and to walk humbly with you. So Lord God, I pray for each and every one of us on this call um, that you would help us and guide us and lead us into the path everlasting. Uh, thank you for the work that uh, my other brothers are doing uh, in the space of reconciliation, Lord God, bless them in their efforts. Um, Lord God, just use us in a very mighty way that we will bring your glory, uh, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. In Christ Jesus' name we all pray. Amen.